Cross is online. And looks like we are recording. Felder is online. So for announcements and reminders, I guess I'll give you the stuff that you should know anyway by now since we're not, it's not even eight yet. So a lot of people will miss these. But um, yeah, you know, the usual for lab, don't be late. Um, I am behind on grading on labs, which is bad in one way, good in another bad, because I love to give you guys feedback and grades quickly so you can adjust. But on the same token, or the same note, um, if I haven't graded it yet then, and you haven't turned it in yet, you still have time to turn it in. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you get it turned in before I get around to grading it for labs and pre-labs, I consider that on time. So sorry for those of you who are on time. Classmates who haven't done it yet. So there you go. Uh, what else to say? Don't forget to dress properly for lab today. You know, at least closed toe shoes and some pants. Um, be prepared. This lab for uh, that we're doing today is a lot of waiting. It's not that hard, but there's a, a lot of measurements that you take within what 15 minute increments, I think. So be prepared for that. What else about lab? Pretty much it about lab. Any questions about lab? All right, another one, the exam. I, I talked a lot about this for the people who had lab on Monday, um, and it was recorded, and I'll post that soon too. But um, for the exam, you guys did pretty good as a class. Um, I would say you've read the announcement, but I think a lot of you didn't read the announcement, so I'll basically be repeating myself from what I said in the announcement. Moving forward, uh, this is my hint, because I kind of just told you guys on, on this last one. You should watch those videos. I have videos where I've done exam reviews from previous semesters. And I told you last week, you should really watch those. And I can tell some of you did because, does anybody remember that really weird question in the exam that made no sense? Well, in the video, I said, if you get that question right, you'll get a 10% boost to your grade, whatever your grade is. And I told you the correct answer to the weird worded question was gonna be tissue. They knew that got a 10% boost to their grade. So I highly recommend when I share those videos of me doing exam reviews to watch those exam reviews. Um, the same thing I said on Monday to the lab people. I'm, I'm very tricky that way. And I'll never be tricky in a way that hurts you, but I'll always be tricky in ways that'll help you, right? Little things, little Easter eggs here and there that if you get, it'll help you. So please pay close attention to details. And when I highly recommend something, then you should probably take me up on that and do whatever it is I'm highly recommending. Um, let's see, 7.59, I go back to attendance very quickly. We have, let's see, Hemmings. I see there's six people online, but no. Okay, Hemmings, Bowers. Bowers is online. Asbury is here and wearing WBSU gear, so that's a little bit of extra points. Um, Newton, not here. Cedric is online. Polly, Eric, don't see Eric. Sipple. Don't see Sipple. Oh, thanks. Of course, for the online people, it's just a formality because obviously, as you guys know, you need to do the, you have to send in the words. And technically, I should be getting, every time we do this, I get a little spreadsheet sent automatically from Google that tells me who was online, what time they logged in, and what time they logged off. But as I'm sure you've noticed in the short time we've had this course, technology fails me often. So me marking down who's online is just a little bit of extra. Extra precaution. Anyway, Hodges is online. David and Sharp Kip. All right. Well, anybody in person I didn't miss or didn't call? I got you earlier. Um, all right. Well, it is 8.01. So let me think before we get started. I'm Follow the, follow the advice. Um, another thing is, and if you, you might not know, 
retake it. And when you retake the exam, it will be open book and it will be non-timed. So basically, you just look everything up and find the correct answers. The only catch is, and it's not really much of a catch, it's just that it's going to be an average of your two scores. So three of you haven't even taken the exam and you have a big fat zero, but you, just like everyone else, can retake the exam. So if you score 100% on the retake, then that averages out to a 50, right? So you'll end up with a 50. A zero and a 100 averages out to a 50. Um, and that, so that basically that means if you miss the first exam, you're not, you haven't like put the nail in your coffin yet, right? You can still recover from that because you can still possibly get a 50. And then moving forward, you can listen to me when I say, hey, the exam's on Monday, the exam's on Monday, the exam's on Monday, don't miss the exam, the exam's on Monday. Um, so anyway, yes. Anyway, and the rest of you, right? So if you uh, did the exam and you got a 50, for example, and then you retake it, and you get a 100, then you're going to end up with a 75, right? So your exam scores can be improved. If somehow you because it's untimed and it's open book, but if that were to somehow happen, I would just keep your original higher grade. So you will have nothing to lose when the time comes, when I send out the announcement that you can retake the exam. You know, it's going to do nothing but help your score and help you learn the stuff you didn't learn um, in the past three chapters. Because all that stuff, all that information is important moving forward. Anyway, so keep an eye out for the announcements uh, for when I open the exam. It seems like I'm uh, preaching to the, not preaching to the choir, but it's going on deaf ears. Read my announcements. So it's too late now, but I think that last announcement that I posted said, if you read this announcement, reply to the email and you will get a 5% boost to whatever grade you have on independent work. And one of you has like 90 something points of independent work right now, so that would have really put you close to the edge. So read my announcements, please. I try not to bombard you with them. That's why they're long, because I prefer to do longer, fewer longer announcements than um, many short announcements. So one, you're gonna get invaluable information, and two, sometimes just like on the last one, you could have had a 5% boost to whatever independent work you have. So anyway, I guess all this to say is if you're feeling a little bit down because the exam grades weren't where you wanted them to be, don't feel down. You can make up for points with independent work. You can retake the exam. Oh, yeah, and then one more thing. You can only retake the exam up until the second exam, right? So that's the cutoff date. After that, you can no longer retake the first exam. But after that point, I can meet you online and go through the exam with you, your exam, and tell you exactly what you got right and tell you exactly what you got wrong and talk to you about why the wrong answer is the wrong answer. And if you allow me to do that, that will be a 5% boost to that exam grade. So again, one, you can retake it. And then two, after that, you can meet me and I can give you even more um, feedback and give you even more points. So, you know, don't worry if you didn't get a good exam grade. It's definitely, you're definitely able to come back from that. So anyway, any questions about exams or anything else? All right. If you're in person or excuse me, if you're online, I don't think I can um, hear you. online make sure you send the words by 9 a.m don't share the words with anybody because you know if they weren't here and i see that if you're watching the video instead of sending me the word cycle send me a picture of or instead of sending me the word bicycle um send me a picture of a bicycle right a drawing a picture whatever of a bicycle all right let's get into it so let me back up a little bit, actually. So we were talking about ATP. And I did say, if anything, the one thing you should remember from Chapter 5, if you forget everything else, is just the one simple fact that cells need ATP for energy, right? Cells need ATP. That's where they get their energy from. That is directly where they get their energy from, because we've already said previously that in the big scheme of things, we all get our energy from the sun. But that's where cells directly get their energy from. That's what you should remember from Chapter 5. 
cells get their energy directly from ATP. Because then chapter six is going to be, how do we make ATP? And the answer is glucose. And then chapter seven is going to be, well, how do we make glucose? Right? So these are the three themes that we're dealing with. But anyway, we left off talking about ATP. I was giving you some examples of why your cells need ATP. Your book just was talking about, you know, uh, for example, when you move your arm or your leg, right? When you move a muscle, you use ATP. Um, when you get things inside and outside of your cell, which we're going to talk about later, you're going to need energy to do that sometimes. Um, and that's what it's used for. When you're trying to build more molecules, you need ATP. And I did say on Friday that those are just examples. You don't need to know those examples. But I will go back to this, too, because this is another very important concept that I'm going to say over and over again for the next three chapters at least. However much energy it takes to build a molecule, so however much energy it takes to build an XY molecule, however much energy it takes to build it, as far as we're concerned, that's how much energy is released when you break those bonds. So, um, you know, however much energy it took to make the ATP, that's how much energy is released when you knock off one of those phosphates and turn it into ADP. So instead of ATP, which is three phosphates, it's ADP, which is two phosphates. Which brings us to this. The ATP cycle. So if you remember, and I know it's a long time ago, when we first started talking about ATP, I basically described it as a rechargeable battery, right? I said ATP, it's ready to go. It goes wherever it needs to go in the cell to provide energy to whichever um, molecules need it. Um, and then once you lose that energy, it's then called ADP, right? So once that one phosphate comes off, you no longer have three phosphates, you have two. And I... Um, Describe that almost as the dead rechargeable battery. And that's basically what the ATP cycle is. And I'm sorry to tell you there's going to be a lot of cycles in this three, these three chapters on this uh, upcoming exam. Um, that's the bad news. The good news is the ATP cycle is the easiest one of them. Because basically this is it. It goes from ATP to ADP. So the way I describe it, it's fully charged. It's full of energy. It's ready to go. DB, dead battery, but you don't have to write that down. This is a way to think of it. And that's basically it, right? We have the fully charged battery. It releases its phosphate, which releases energy, and it is now ADP. And then it takes energy. You have to put input energy to put that phosphate back on, and you back up at ATP. So let's read what your book says. Cells spend ATP continuously. And it is recycled when ADP and the phosphate combine right here, right? And that takes energy to put those things together using the energy released by cellular respiration, which is essentially what the next chapter is going to be, which is chapter six. So even though we're not there yet, if you were to forget everything else in chapter six, at least know that one bullet point, right? We use the energy released by cellular respiration to recharge ATP, so to speak, or to make ATP. I'm going to put it next to this next bullet point because I'm not going to ask this. This is one of those numbers I don't really care for you to memorize. But yeah, just so you know, it's about 10 million ATPs that are consumed and recycled every second in a working muscle cell. So in one of your single working muscle cells, you use about 10 million ATP per second. How much ATP do you use in a second in your entire body? Because that's just one cell. It would be a little bit inaccurate, but you could just figure out the average number of cells for a human and multiply that by about 10, 10 million. And that's how many seconds per second. But of course, obviously, for example, I probably have a lot more cells than she does. Um, and of course, muscle cells are going to be a lot different than, I don't know, bone cells. But anyway, it's a ballpark figure. You can look it up for independent work if you want. Any questions about this slide? All right. There's a picture from your book. It's basically a visualization of what we're saying. It's pretty simple, right? Here you have this ADP and a phosphate. It's not very energetic. We can't really use it. But we want to squeeze this phosphate onto the ADP to make ATP. Well, if you remember, those phosphates are really negative, so they're hard to squeeze together. It's going to take some energy to do it, so we have an input of energy 
from cellular respiration, which we'll talk a lot about chapter six, and that gives us the fully charged ATP. And that thing is then ready, like a fully charged battery, to go do its business. And once it does, the way it does it is it releases that phosphate group, because however much energy was used to squeeze that phosphate on there, that's how much is released when you take it back off. So any questions about that? about enzymes um, and we briefly talked about enzymes in chapter three because we were talking about the four biological molecules one of which was proteins and we talked about all the different types of proteins and one of those types of proteins was enzymes and I told you the enzyme would be uh, one of the more important ones because we will be talking about enzymes for almost the entire semester up until we get past organisms like once we start talking about um, population very important so pay close attention this is a very important section this is has implications for the entire semester enzymes before we talk about enzymes you know need to know what the word metabolism is and your book defines it as all chemical reactions in an organism so all the chemical reactions that are happening in you right now that's metabolism and there's a lot because remember I just told you it's about in ATP used per second per cell, per muscle cell in you. That's just one second and that's just one cell. And that's just one type of chemical reaction, right? That's just ATP being used. There's a lot more. There's a lot of chemical reactions going on in you right now. Actually, without those chemical reactions, obviously you'd be dead. But here's the thing. Most of those chemical reactions, and again, there's a ton of them, most of them require enzymes. So this is not trivial stuff. Without these enzymes, these chemical reactions wouldn't happen and you would be dead. Again, using the ATP as the example since we just talked about it. Without enzymes, you couldn't make ATP. You would be dead. So what are enzymes? You need to know this. It's very, very important. One, because you're gonna be tested on it. And two, to understand things moving forward, you need to understand these concepts. Enzymes are proteins. And that are not consumed in the chemical reactions. So first know those three things. And also I would say this too. Let me underline this. Oh man, I wish this thing drew properly. Because I didn't want to underline proteins. Your book says that they speed up chemical reactions. Then they do in fact speed up chemical reactions. But there's a more important way to look at them. Not only do they speed chemical reactions up, but in so many cases, these chemical reactions just could not happen without the enzymes. So a better way to say it would be that enzymes are proteins. You could say they facilitate chemical reactions, maybe. And of course, they're not consumed in the process. The whole not consumed thing will be a little bit important later. But for now, you definitely need to know the proteins. Because as I said in chapter three, proteins are dependent on their shape. And so are these things. And again, they're important because so many of these chemical reactions just wouldn't happen without the proteins, without these enzymes. And even though you don't necessarily need to know this as in a test question, this is something good to keep in the back of your mind. Stupid thing will not draw for me. Anyway, um, there are thousands of different enzymes in your, in your cells. Matter of fact, you can look that up for independent work if you want. But I'm sure that number changes as technology gets better and um, more research is done. I'm sure thousands is still a, an accurate description from your textbook. But if you were to look it up, I bet you could find a more specific answer. But yeah, there's thousands of them. And they each promote a different reaction. So in many cases, there's like one enzyme that handles one particular chemical reaction. And that's it. So the very specific the reactions that they facilitate. Any questions so far? We're still going to talk more about enzymes, but this is the good introduction to them. All that information is very important, except again, maybe that second bullet point that I put an X through, which is good to keep in the back of your mind. I'm not really going to explain this picture yet too much because I will moving you know, later, but you can see this purple thing is an enzyme. 
see there's this molecule that's like two rings that comes in and fits together. And then it does its magic. And then look, the chemical reaction is done. So instead of having one double ring molecule, you now have two single ringed molecules. And that's just an example. You definitely don't need to write anything down about maltose and the active site and glucose. Um, need to understand is activation energy. It's a very important. Understand um, activation energy. But to fully understand a lot, of I'm going to teach you uh, for the rest of the semester or a good portion of it. You need to understand enzymes. So, what is activation energy? You need to know this for the exam. It is the energy invested to start a reaction. So, think about, for example, have any of you been to like a really, really big bonfire? Okay. Depending on how they set it up, sometimes people like to cheat. And they'll just put like a bunch of cardboard and paper and then leaves and then wood and then dump a bunch of gas on it, right? That thing's ready to go. But, and when you do, when it does light, right, there's a lot of energy released, right? It's all that heat, that's energy being released from the chemical uh, bonds of the, mole of the molecules that are uh, inside that fire pit. But it's not just going to light itself, right? You have to at least put a lighter to it. Or if you're smart, maybe light a piece of paper from, from afar and throw it in there. Right, because it's probably going to blow up pretty big. But anyway, that would be the activation energy, right? So no matter how much a uh, chemical reaction wants to happen, or however much energy might be released in a chemical reaction, put so in energy into it. Now think about that too. If you light a match, for example, that little flame, that's not much energy, right? And then you put it to the fire pit, and then boof, right? It's a lot of fire, a lot of energy. So you only put in a little energy, and then you got a lot more out. But again, you still needed that little bit of energy, that small amount of energy, to get it started. And that's basically what activation energy is. The new book gets pretty specific. Um, and what does that activation energy used to do? It activates reactants. I'm going to put it next to that because I feel like that's too broad. That's not specific enough. We'll talk a little bit more later. I'll give you some specific examples of activating reactants. So for now, you can just brain dump it if you want. But yeah, technically it activates reactants. Or more importantly, this part right here, it triggers ah, triggers chemical reactions. So again, like I said earlier, you know, enzymes, a lot of these chemical reactions wouldn't happen without the enzymes. Reason being is too much energy. So without enough energy, they won't start. So activation energy is that energy that it triggers the chemical reaction. It is the match to the fire. Or to use this. When you pull that string back, you can't really tell by looking, but when you pull the string back as a cross of the crossbow, right, it takes energy. You're pulling it back. That's kinetic energy. And then it clicks. Right, then you can let go of the string because it stays there. All that energy that you pulled in, put into there, it's ready to go when you pull the trigger. And that's going to be the chemical reaction. You pulling the trigger, that's the chemical reaction, right? You putting the energy into pulling the trigger, that's the activation energy, right? There's a lot of energy ready to go, you know, when that thing goes flying forward. But there has to be some sort of energy put into the system for that to happen. And in that case, that's the trigger. So the trigger is the activation energy. Does that make sense? Because, again, if this thing is built properly, it's not just going to shoot itself, which is a good thing, right? But, yeah, it requires energy to pull that trigger to then release that crossbow. And then, again, that all that potential energy from the structure will be released and it'll turn into kinetic energy, so on and so forth, all the stuff we talked about earlier in the chapter. So then, what's this have to do with enzymes? Well, right here, second bullet point. Enzymes reduce the amount of energy required to break the bonds of the reactive molecules here let me let's put it this way again this is from your book i think here's what you need to know enzymes reduce the amount of energy let's just leave it at that specifically activation energy so if you're taking notes that would be better than what's on the screen but again this is verbatim from your book enzymes reduce the amount of activation energy needed that's basically it 
And I don't know how many of you have shot crossbows or guns before. If you're really familiar with them, like if you ever shot a gun that has a trigger and then you replaced it with a different trigger, like a hairpin trigger, sometimes they're easier to shoot, right? And in the sense, that would be the same kind of thing. So you have one trigger that's kind of hard to pull, but it still does the trick. It still releases X amount of energy once you pull it. But then you get an easier trigger to pull, like right, you barely hit it, and then you release the, the energy. Now you're still releasing the same amount of energy, whether you have a hard to pull trigger or a really light trigger. It's just that having that really light trigger, you know, you, you're putting less energy into it to release it. So any questions about what enzymes are in relation to activation energy, right? Enzymes reduce the amount of activation energy needed to start that fire or start that chemical reaction. I keep thinking of the bonfire now. It's almost camping season. All right. If there's no questions about this, um, I guess the next attendance word, even though this is not a gun, it kind of looks like a gun, at least in that part, right? So, again, if you're in person and want to send it before 9 a.m., go ahead. If you're online streaming right now, send the word gun before 9 a.m. for full, your attendance. And if you're watching the video, send me a picture of a gun. Not that picture, because that's a crossbow. Anyway, here's a visualization of what we're talking about, right? So here we have this high energy thing, uh, high energy molecule. So again, you could think of, remember ATP was high energy because it took all that energy to build it. That's what I mean by this thing being high energy. It took a lot of energy to build whatever this thing is, this reactant, right? And the chemical reaction is going to break these molecules, which we know is a hydrolysis reaction. Um, anyway, it's going to break those molecules. And however much energy was put into building this molecule, right, that bond right there, however much energy was there is going to be released once you break those bonds. So you go from a high energy to low energy. But again, the thing is, you got to have the activation energy, right? You need some input of energy. And I like the way your book puts, uh, shows this because you can almost imagine this as far as physics are concerned, you can almost imagine this as human size and it would still be accurate. Here you have this, I don't know, to me that looks like a, a dumbbell. Does that look like a dumbbell to you guys? Like one of those things you work out with? To me, that's what it looks like. So imagine, you know, it's got a lot of energy because you're up on a building. And as you guys probably know from potential energy from way back when, uh, before you were in this class, the higher you are, the more potential energy, right? So anyway, if you were to throw it over the building, it's going to turn that into kinetic energy. And then once it hits the ground, you know, it's going to have less potential energy because it went from being way up here to way down there. But if you're on the building and there's a little wall, first you've got to get the thing over the wall, right? That's going to require a little extra energy. Yes, it's going to go really far, really fast once you get it over there. But first you've got to get it over that little wall. Here, the enzyme lowers the wall, so to speak, right? You have less activation energy. So while here you may have had to like really throw it over, to get it to fall down. Here, you just kind of like pick it up and bloop, there you go, all right? Because there's a lot less activation energy. And I know that seems completely different than it is, because we're talking about molecules versus dumbbells. But as far as physics are concerned, it's the same, because we're going from high energy to low energy. Um, we're going from potential energy, by high potential energy to low potential energy. And we're releasing energy in the process, right? As far as physics are concerned, it's all the same thing, at least the way we're looking at it. learned in the previous slide. There will not be questions on the um, exam about it, so I'll go ahead and skip it. But I will say this, sadly, one experiment but you guys missed a lot of people missed the question about the whole scientific process things well, i think it was the smartphone was how i wrote the question but anyway what was the hypothesis yeah all right so you observe something like hey my, my smartphone won't turn on then you question which by the way a lot of people would guess that one as the as the hypothesis or the prediction the observation was my smartphone is dead that's an observation that's not a hypothesis or a prediction Anyway, so you think, oh, my, or my, my smartphone is dead. That's the observation. 
why is my smartphone dead? A hypothesis is a tentative, testable answer to that question. So the hypothesis to that question would be, or a possible hypothesis would be, the battery is dead, right? Um, so you could do then a prediction that says, if I plug it in, then it will turn on. Because a prediction is a way of testing your hypothesis. But anyway, we don't really have time to get into that. So again, when you retake the exam, if you retake it, you know, think about that. Look it up in the book if you need to. And then afterwards, when everybody's done with their retaking, then we can sit down and talk about it for a boost in your grade. So we know about activation energy now, right? We know what enzymes do, or at least we know why they're important, right? They lower the activation energy, and you need activation energy to start a chemical reaction. Therefore, basically, the enzymes allow chemical reactions to happen that normally just wouldn't happen. So let's talk about the enzyme activities. I've already said this, but we're saying it again, and now it's in writing, so you can let it soak in. Enzymes are very selective. That won't be a test question. That's just an important fact moving forward. But here's some words you do need to know. Substrates. Enzymes recognize something called the substrate, and the substrate is the reactive molecule. So enzymes, basically, they do their work on the substrate. Um, one example that we've already talked about that we never gave it a name, I kept telling you, you know, um, starch is just a bunch of glucose molecules put together, right? So if you think about it, one step of that, we have one glucose, we have another one, we need to put them together, right? So in that case, the glucose molecules would be the substrate, and they, you know, because the enzyme would make that happen. So yes, enzymes work on substrates. Substrates are the molecules that they do their work on, the reactive molecules. Where does it happen? Because the enzymes just don't do it any old place. Look at the enzyme molecule. It happens in a place called the active site. The active site, right? That's where on the enzyme it happens. And I keep talking about form and function. Actually fits. Like I, there's no molecules that, that actually look like this. So it's, a, it's a, just a visualization. But there are the enzymes. They do physically fit like a lock and a key or puzzle piece. They physically do that. So, yeah, the shape fits. But also the chemistry fits, which is a little bit less obvious if you're not a chemist. But if you think about it like this, if this thing had a positive charge right here, what charge do you think would be right here? If that thing, right, these things, as you can see in this picture, these things come together, right? That fits into that. So if this thing was positive, what charge do you think that would be? Negative. I think I heard somebody say it. wrong and I know you're thinking the wrong thing and maybe I can figure out why and we can talk about it and you can learn from it but anyway yeah if that's positive then you're gonna want that to be negative right because positive and negatives go together so that's what it means if this was nonpolar that should be nonpolar so on and so forth anyway that All right, what's this a picture of? A little bit hard to tell because it's a silhouette, but it's not that hard to tell. Can I tell me what that's a picture of? Yeah, it's a hug, right? Which is good since it's the day after Valentine's Day. Yeah, it's a hug. Now, I'm sure you guys have hugged people before. And you see, that's what a hug is, what's the silhouette. But basically, you can imagine they're doing this, right? That's a hug. But even though this is a hug, is that how you do a hug? How many of you, when you hug somebody, go up to them like this? Right? You don't do that, right? Because that's not how it works. You do arms wide open. You both come in with your, your, your wings spread, so to speak. Come together, and then you wrap your arms around each other. And that's what the induced fit is, right? So the substrate, it comes into the active site. And in a sense, the enzymes, like arms wide open, waiting for hugs, so to speak. And then once the um, substrate hits the active site, then it kind of gives it that hug and squeezes it a little bit. And that's what an induced fit is. I will put an X through that because I'm not going to ask you. I don't think I'll ask you about induced fit. And even if you forget what an induced fit is, you can still understand everything else I'm saying. The important thing here is that the substrate 
comes to the active site of the enzyme, and then the enzyme makes the chemical reaction happen. Yes, it happens through an induced fit, but even if you forget that, you should be okay. So anyway, any questions about what substrates are or active sites are or how those things are related? I know we just did one, but since we're talking about it anyway, uh, the next word for attendance will be sunset. All right, I guess that's two words. No, one, one word, sunset. Sunset is the next attendance uh, word. So again, if you're in person, if you're watching this live, send the word sunset along with the other ones before 9 a.m. If you're watching the video, send me a picture of a sunset. Or for extra credit, you buy me a plane ticket and send me off to some place with a beautiful sunset. Actually, don't do that. I get in a lot of trouble, I'm sure. That would be my luck. There'd be some really low-key rich person in our class, and we didn't know it, and they bought me a ticket, and then they could tell the school. He said buy him a ticket for extra credit, and I did. I'd be so screwed. Better be a good ticket. All right. So, again, we're still talking about how, uh, how the enzymes work. After the product is released, which is right here, right? it did its job, the products are released, then the enzyme is free to accept another substrate molecule, which is another way of saying that the enzymes are not used up in the chemical reaction, like I said before. They're not used up. They just facilitate it. They make it happen, and then they're free to do their job again, almost like a toaster oven. So the little slots in the toaster oven, those are the active sites. The bread... That's the, um, right, those are the uh, reactant molecules, right? Those are the substrates. They go into the little toaster slots, and then the chemical reactions happen. Um, and then, boop, it pops up. The toast, which are the products, is released. And then your toaster oven, your toaster is ready to go again, right? So, yes, you needed the toaster to make the toast, but it was not a part of uh not a part of the reaction, so to speak. It wasn't used up in the reaction, right? It's not necessary. The toaster was not a product, and it was not a reactant. It was just the thing that made it happen. And again, like your book is saying here, the ability to function repeatedly is a key characteristic of enzymes. Which I basically just said in other words. so to speak, and then you get toast plus a toaster, right? Of course, I'm not going to ask you about bread and toast and toasters, but that's what I'm saying, right? So the toaster oven is on both sides of the chemical reaction because it's not used up. Same thing here. Another thing to notice, too, and this is going to be really important in the exam, as far as we're concerned, almost, yeah, as far as we're concerned in this class, every single enzyme is named after its substrate, and it ends in ACE. So for the exam, I'm going to give you a chemical equation you never, you've never seen before. Well, in theory. And it'll say this reactant plus this reactant plus this enzyme gives you this product plus this enzyme. And you're, I'm going to ask you which one is the substrate and which one is the um, enzyme. And moving forward here in a few seconds, I'm going to show you how you can tell. But for now, just know that they're named after the substrates. So if you see something like galactase, you can say, oh, it ends in ACE. So that must be the enzyme. Galactase is the enzyme. And let's see, there's something called galactose. And these things are named after the substrates. So galactose must be the substrate. And again, I'm going to give you some examples moving forward. So I won't take questions on that bullet point yet. We'll just leave it at that. Again, the main thing here for this slide is you need to understand that enzymes are not used up in chemical reactions, right? They facilitate them. They, re they work repeatedly, like a toaster, right? Once, those, once that toast pops out, 
then you have the, the little slots ready to put more bread in and make more toast. So here we go. Here's what we're talking about. This is a real example. So here's an enzyme called lactase. Any question, any um, guesses to what the substrate of lactase might be? Don't be shy. The enzyme is called lactase, and enzymes are named after their um, substrates. So what do you think the substrate might be called? Lactulose. Yes, thank you. And if you happen to send me words for uh, you know, the attendance words for extra credit today, remind me that you keep guessing and keep guessing correctly um, so you get even a little bit more extra credit. Anyway, yes, the substrate is called lactose. The lactose fits in to the active site. And then we call that substrate binding. Not that I'm going to ask you that. Then it does its magic, right? We want to break those two things to, up, right? We have a molecule that has two smaller molecules put together. We want to break it. We know that as a hydrolysis reaction. And of course, I guess I can go ahead and tell you as far as, I don't think I'm going to ask you about that anymore. We're leaving that back in um, the first exam. Hy hydrolysis versus um, dehydration. But anyway, yes, that's a dehydration or hydrolysis. glucose are free, and then the active site's open again, the enzyme's ready to do its job. Again. Just, like a, just like the toaster oven, right? Put the bread in, it toasts it, toast pops out, toaster's ready to go, toaster's ready to go again. So for the exam, not, I mean, you could minimize this, you or glucose, or lactase, that's just a... Uh, just an example, right? So you don't even memorize those exact things. But again, I will give you a question where I give you a chemical reaction. Of course, this isn't a chemical reaction, you know, with the, with the molecules and the arrows. This would say, if it was a chemical reaction, it would say, let's see, uh, lactose plus lactase with an arrow. And then it would say lactase and the lactose and glucose, right? Because that's what you made. I would draw it, but as you can see, it. Well, I could try. No, nah, I'm not even going to try. It'll just, it'll look ugly. And I'll give you another example later. So are there any questions about this picture? And that's basically how enzymes work. I also say, too, let me point this out. This is also, as far as I'm concerned, again, I just want to reiterate this. The fact that it's a hydrolysis reaction, I'm not concerned about it at all. Because not all enzymes work this way. We're not always trying to break up a bigger molecule into two smaller molecules. Sometimes it's the opposite, right? Sometimes we want to put some things together, in which case, you know, you would be creating water, not using it. So, again, don't worry about the water portion of this picture. All right. Now that you know basically how enzymes work, let's talk about how they don't work, so to speak. Let's talk about enzyme inhibitors. Before we talk about that, though, let's talk about the word inhibition outside of a biological context. So does anybody know what inhibitions are? Don't think about biology, just think about in your every, every day, everyday usage of the term inhibitions. What does somebody usually mean when they're talking about inhibitions? For example, one of the reasons they tell you not to drink a lot is because they says, well, that lowers your inhibitions. Well, what do they mean by that? When you drink a lot, it can lower your inhibitions. So what is what are inhibitions in that context? Glad we're talking. Uh, glad we're talking about this. Because yes, alcohol definitely does that. But it also does something else, which is a little bit different than that. All right. So your inhibitions are basically the things that keep you from doing stupid crap. Right? So your inhibitions keep you from taking your shirt off when you're singing karaoke at the bar, right? Inhibitions say, hey, don't do that. But when you drink, sometimes that lowers your inhibitions and you're like, phew, forget it. I'm taking my shirt off in this crowded bar, right? So that's what an inhi inhibitions are. They keep you from doing something. And it's the same thing in this case. Of course, enzymes aren't trying to take their, bar off or their shirt off at a karaoke bar, but they do do stuff. We talked about what they did. So as you might imagine, in, uh, enzyme inhibitors keep them from doing what they do, right? Enzyme inhibitors inhibit metabolic reaction, is the nerdy way of saying 
They keep them from doing their job. They keep them from doing whatever it is they do. Like that lactase enzyme, it breaks up lactose. So we're breaking up lactose, right? It just keeps it from doing its job. How does it do? This general um, description. They bind to the enzyme, and then that disrupts the function. So really. What does that mean? Well, binding to the enzyme actually inhibits it from doing its job. So that's how enzyme inhibitors basically work. I'm going to get a little bit more specific, as you might imagine. But yeah, that's generally how they work. They bind to the enzyme. That keeps the enzyme from doing its job. So there's different types. The first one we're going to talk about is this one here, a substrate imposter. And that's that meme that you can see right here. I didn't make it. I found it. found it in the wild of social media. But even though it's a little bit goofy, it's still kind of uh, still kind of accurate. Even though I'm going to describe it in the next slide, I'll go ahead and describe it for what you see here. This is the enzyme, right? This Pac-Man looking thing, and then that's its substrate. Its proper substrate is that blue thing. You can see that that thing is supposed to fit in there perfectly, right? That's the substrate that that enzyme is supposed to be working on. But then this thing came in, and look, it fits just fine right there. It's not the substrate, but it fits just fine in that one spot. So because of that thing being in there. The substrate can't come in, therefore it can't do its job. And as goofy as that is, and as simple as that is, that is basically how imposters, substrate imposters work. It's just that simple. They keep it from working. Going back to my toaster analogy, if you were to put two, I don't know, pieces of metal that are the same size as toast, right? They fit just fine, or I don't know, piece of metal, whatever. Something that won't burn. But it's the same size as the bread, you put it into the toaster, Right? It's not going to make toast with that thing in there. And also, you can't put bread in there because you've clogged up the holes of the toaster. Same thing, right? That would be a substrate imposter. Oh, that's it. Yeah, so that's it. So that's it. Number one, substrate imposter. Plugs up the active site. It's the fake bread in your toaster. So any questions about the first one? The second one's a little bit more complicated. Because it binds to a different spot. It's still, again, I already told you earlier that both versions bind to the enzyme. The first version that we talked about was the imposter. It bonds to the, binds to the active site. The other one is the these that bind somewhere else, right? They don't bind to the active site. They bind somewhere else. In this case, it happens to be the other side. It could be anywhere. And you can see here the substrate kind of looks like a pumpkin tooth looking thing, jack o' lantern tooth. But then when this thing comes in, you don't need to worry about that word allosteric site. But when it binds to the enzyme, you see the shape change. So now the substrate can't fit in there. Not because this inhibitor blocked the uh, active site, but because, because it changed the shape of it. So the priority for understanding this is first, you just need to, the most important thing you need to understand is that enzymes work, or excuse me, enzyme inhibitors work by binding to the enzymes and preventing it from doing its job. Memorize that first. Then a little bit less important is understanding the two different types, right? Does it bind to the substrate or to the active site or does it bind somewhere else? And honestly, for a 100 level bio biology class, the distinction between the two is not that important. I might ask one question about it on And everything I'm about to teach you because when I talk about inhibitors moving forward first of all I'm barely going to talk about them again and second of all I'm never going to distinguish moving forward whether it's the active site or where it's somewhere else so again for the exam I might ask one question about it but most likely you're not going to need to understand the difference between the two different types of enzyme inhibitors I guess the next word for attendance is, like I said, that kind of reminded me of it, will be pumpkin. That kind of looks like, you know, that kind of looks like a pumpkin tooth. Unless you carve it like that. But again, still kind of looks like jack-o'-lantern tooth. So, yes, yeah, so the next word is pumpkin. So if you're in person, want the extra credit, send it before 9 a.m. If you're live streaming online, 
send that word along with the other word before 9 a.m. And if you're download or excuse me, if you're watching the video at a later date, um, send me a picture of a pumpkin before the next lecture, because uh, then it'll be late. Anyway, any questions about that? Here's the picture from your book. It's the same thing I've been talking about, except it's a picture from your book. You can see up top, you have the enzyme doing its thing. Normally, right, that's the shape of the enzyme. Uh, the active site, you can see the substrate fits just fine. That's up top. Here in the middle, we have an enzyme inhibition by a substrate imposter. So we've got this red thing that's not the substrate, but it fits in there just fine. It blocks it from going in. And then here we have one that um, binds somewhere else. And that changes the shape of the active site, therefore the substrate can't fit. Either way, right, no matter what, well, how does it work? We have something binding to it, which prevents the um, substrate from coming into the active site. It just happens in you know, two different ways. All right. Moving forward. Here's a important concept. Not so much important for the exam or for this uh, for the semester, because again, this is one of those concepts that if you were to brain dump it, for the most part, you should be okay because it's not going to come back up. But this is an important concept for understanding how things work in general. So the binding of an inhibitor can be reversible, meaning if you have a substrate imposter, like we were just talking about, or any substrate, uh, excuse me, enzyme inhibitor, it's not always. need that then? Why do we need substrate inhibitors to begin with? And again, this is important just for understanding things in general. Sometimes your enzymes can produce more products than your cells need, right? So you need basically an on and off switch because you all have limited resources, right? You have limited energy and you have limited matter. So your enzymes just can't go making stuff all the time if your body doesn't need them. You guys are a little bit young, but you might remember this. Does anybody remember fidget spinners? You guys remember them? Okay. Remember, they were like a huge craze for like, I don't know, maybe a year. But they were like, everyone had them, all the kids anyway. Everyone seemed to have had them. But then all of a sudden, boom, no one cared about them anymore. Remember that? So imagine if you owned a toy company. Or excuse me. Oh, yeah, a toy company too. You had a factory. And then all of a sudden, all the kids love fidget spinners. So you're like, all right, guys, you quit making that. You quit making that. You quit making that. Everybody devote your time and money and resources and all of our equipment into making fidget spinners, right? And you're just churning them out. And you're making a ton of money from it. But then all of a sudden, again, the fidget spinners stop becoming popular. So you don't want to waste all those resources making fidget spinners. You want to go back to making the other stuff you made. So you reverse it, right? Or you, you change things. It's the same thing here, right? So at one point, your cells need whatever it is the enzyme is making. And it, it's doing its job. And then it's like, all right, whoa, whoa, that's enough. So it stops it. That's what the inhibitor is for. And then again, uh, eventually you might need those, those products again. So you can reverse the inhibition and then the enzymes can go back to doing the job. That's all we're saying. This is a really long winded way of saying, first of all, enzymes do need to be inhibited sometimes because you don't always need them making their stuff. And two, it can be reversed. Those are the two main points there. Well, that's it. This will be pill. Picture of a pill and also or extra credit if you're on and watching the video. Like the video and send a screenshot that you liked it. And that'll be.